الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ويسك الله سبحانه وتعالى He grants us to seek and success He makes us of those who are guided and guide others We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He teaches us that which will benefit us and that He benefits us that which that He teaches us This is another session where we are looking at the book Zawaj by Sheikh Muhammad bin Salih uh, al-Thameen Rahimahullah And inshallah today we are going to be looking at what he has to say when it comes to those people who are mahram to us uh, we're going to be looking at, inshallah, what he has to say about polygyny and the hikmah, the, the general wisdom uh, concerning marriage and those things which marriage would then uh, bring on as follow on ahkam, such as mahar and maintenance and inheritance and those things. More explanation on that. And then he's got a little bit about talaq and the repercussions of talaq. So he says, Al-Fasl al khamis So now remember, this is just a lecture from the Sheikh, so it's not meant to be uh, detailed. But part of what he is saying when it comes to marriage is from the effects of marriage and those things which are connected to marriage uh, are those things which uh, become mahram for one another. Those people that become mahram for one another. So here, now he's talking about fil muharramat bin nikah. Those people who are have that mahramiyyah when it comes to nikah. Now the shaykh is saying here, those who are mahram to you are of two types. Those who are permanently mahram to you and those who are temporarily mahram. Or, and we use the word mahram here, the shaykh is saying here, mahram. Those who are, you are not permitted to get married to. Okay? So those who are permanently you are not permitted to get married to and those who are temporarily you are not permitted to get married to. So it's important that we understand the distinction between the two. Those who are permanently mahram, he says they are in three categories. So we've got two categories. From the first one, we've got three. Those who are mahram through lineage. And that is the common use of the word mahram. And you will find their description in Surah and nisa You will find their description in Surah and nur Surah Ahzab. And the Shaykh gives us an example from Surah nisa Ayah number 23. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ مَحْرُمْ for you أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ Your mothers وَبَنَاتُكُمْ Your daughters وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ Your sisters وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ وَخَالَاتُكُمْ Your aunties from both sides وَبَنَاتُ الْأَخْ وَبَنَاتُ الْأُخْ And your nieces So from this we now know that there are those people who are permanently mahram. With this now we learn that those who are not on that list it is permissible for you to get married to. And it's impermissible for you to mix with. They have to wear their hijab in front of you. You cannot be alone with them. You can't travel with them. You can't uh, you know, be a guardian for their marriage, etc. So what's the delil to say that I can get married to my cousin's sister? They are not on that list. What's the delil that a man can't get married to his niece? She's on the list. So the Sheikh is saying here, here we've got the mother. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word mother. The shaykh is saying here. Now this is again, no difference of opinion between the fuqaha on this. حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتْ Who is your mother? Your mother is your biological mother. But the shaykh is saying here, your mother and what ascends from that. So that basically means your mother, your mother's mother, your mother's mother's mother, your mother's 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 mother and the list as it can go on if they're alive. So whoever is called a mother, either from the mother's side, the mother's mother or the father's mother, that is included in. And the same when it comes to your daughters. Your daughter, your daughter's daughter, your daughter's daughter, your daughter's daughter's daughter, and the list can go on. Your sisters, so now obviously the relationship between mothers and sisters are not going to be the same when it comes to you as an individual, but includes sisters in all senses of the word. So how is that? Full sisters and half-sisters. So you could share the same dad or you could share the same mother. That's your sister. Your aunt. Now here, when it comes to your aunts, uh, we don't have that same sort of principle and that same sort of rule. So what we're talking about here are the aunts of... Uh, your brother's 
sorry, your father's brother and your mother's brother, sorry, say that again, your father's sister and your mother's sister, they are now included in aunts. Now in the Arabic language you have uh, a feminine and a masculine for that. But the Sheikh is also saying here, included in that are the the, the sisters of your grandfathers and the sisters of your great great grandfathers and that's how that could go up وَبَنَاتُ الْأَخْ وَبَنَاتُ الْأُخْتِ meaning your nieces so included in that are the daughters of your siblings but that could also then include full siblings and half siblings these are now are the permanent mahram through lineage. The second category who are permanent mahram to you, but they are not through lineage, is through breastfeeding. This is due to the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is in Bukhari and Muslim, Yahrum min al-Rada, ma yahrum min nasab. Meaning, if a person has been breastfed, that mahramiyah is established just like it would be established if there was lineage between them. And the Shaykh, uh, he talks about the different conditions that are necessary for that. We don't really need to go into the ahkam of breastfeeding right now. But the Shaykh has now established for us that that is now the second permanent mahram. Meaning, if you are breastfed by a woman that was not your mother, I don't think culturally we have that, but it does exist, especially in Arab culture, that woman now becomes a permanent mahram for you. Now, through breastfeeding, you don't get the same sort of rules that you would with your normal biological mother. So you don't inherit from one another, you don't need to keep ties of kinship, but what it basically means is there is no hijab. And you are uh, you know, you are her mahram, so you can escort her, etc. Then the Shaykh talks about those permanent mahrams through marriage. And these are four. Number one, the father-in-law and the mother-in-law so I'm just going to put that into one but the Sheikh has put that into two separate and then your stepchildren so that's three now yeah your mother-in-law, your father-in-law and your stepchildren these are all mahram for you permanently so if a man gets married to a woman your parents, I mean your father, is automatically a mahram to her, permanently. So even if you were to divorce her later on, that will always remain. And the same the other way. So your wife's mother will be permanently haram for you once you have done the nikah contract with your wife. And the same applies to stepchildren, except that when it comes to stepchildren, there is a condition which is that you have entered and you have consummated the marriage. Man gets married to a woman. She's got children from a previous marriage. If the marriage hasn't been consummated, those stepchildren are not permanently mahram. But once the marriage has been consummated, those stepchildren are permanently haram for this man. So he is constantly going to be the mahram. As for the step parents, they will be mahram to this person just by the nikah contract. So consummation is not a condition for that. As for stepchildren, consummation is. And the evidence for that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ummahatu nisa'ikum, these are your mothers, meaning your stepmothers, haram, is in that list in Surah An Nisa. Uh, but when it comes to your stepchildren, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it conditional Allati dakhaltum bihin Women that you have married and consummated with on that condition, that consummation do the stepchildren then become mahram These are the permanent ones Okay So through lineage in the list that we found in Surah and nisa but you find in other places in the Quran also through breastfeeding number two and number three through marriage step, uh, sorry, uh, parents-in-law and stepchildren. Then the Shaykh talks about al-Ajal, 
So now these are temporary. So now I don't want anyone to understand that, okay, I can't marry this person so then I can, you know, uh, freely mix with these people. No, mixing with these people is still haram. But it just basically means that you can't get married to them. So the first one is that a man is temporarily impermissible for him to get married to a woman, if he's married to a woman, to be married to her sister or her aunt at the same time. But if he was to divorce her, then he can get married to the sister, it's probably not advisable. But your ex-sister-in-law or your ex-aunt-in-law, then it would be permissible. But at the same time, not allowed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَن تَجْمَعُ بَيْنُ الْأُخْتَيْنِ Not allowed for you to be married to two sisters at the same time. So that's the first one, temporarily. The second one is that a woman is in her idda period. So if a woman is in her idda period, you cannot approach her, you cannot um, uh, propose. She remains the wife of her husband in that idda period. If it is the third talaq or if she is a widow, it is still haram. And the majority of the ulama have said that that contract remains intact. Whereas the Hanafi have said when the person passes away or the pronouncement of the or the pronunciation of the third talaq, that's it, nikah contract is completely nullified. And from that you get difference of opinion in different masail. So they will say, for example, according to the Hanafi, uh, the Hanafi scholars, that a man can't wash her husband or the other way around. Reason why is because at the moment of death, the contract is over. The nikah contract is over. So that's what comes off from that. But here, what we're saying is that whilst she is still in the idda period, there is still that contract. As long as that contract is there, she remains temporarily haram for anyone. The third one that he gives as well is that it is not permissible for a person to marry or even to propose whilst either one of them are in ihram. Either whilst any one of them are in ihram. This is what he talks about when he comes to the mahram. Then he moves on to talking about a fasl al salis fi al idd al mubah fi al nikah, polygamy basically. The Shaykh is saying here, this is now from the hikmah of the sharia uh, in jahiliya and in the times that we live in today, which is not too different if you think about it. People used to cohabit with whoever they wanted. And there wasn't any kind of restriction placed on that. A man would go around and do what he wants. A woman perhaps would even go around in Jahiliya and do what she wants. The Shaykh is saying here, this is fawda, this is chaos, and this is dhul. Whereas the Sharia has come, has said, now this is a really important principle we have to understand. And this is how certain deviant sects don't understand what the Sharia wants from us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not restricting our desires. He's not saying don't eat, don't drink, don't wear nice clothes, don't have goodness from the dunya. Some people will say no, you're not supposed to get anything good from the dunya, renounce the dunya completely. That's not correct. The sharia has come to channel our desires. Without that channeling, the shaykh is basically saying here, people would just do whatever they want. And this is how it was in Jahiliya before. A man used to be married to one, two, three, four, to the extent that when the rulings of marriage came down, there were more than one companion who were married to ten women at one time. So now the thing is that we're understanding here is that the Sharia is saying, listen, these are your desires, this is what you want to eat, this is what you want to drink, this is the car that you want to drive, all of that is permissible for you, but make sure you do it in the correct manner. Otherwise there's going to be chaos and there's going to be dhulm, dhulm on yourself and dhulm on one another. Therefore, the Shaykh is saying here, the hikmah through polygamy, there are a number, and he's going to talk about them. In the introduction, basically what he's saying here is to keep um, a system, keep us in check, keep us through obedience and, and, and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not letting us follow our desires with the things that we want. Therefore, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to marry one, and if you want, two, three, four, or if two, three, four, and if you can't be just, then marry one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is keeping that system there for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us that organization. Who benefits? We all benefit. The man benefits, and the woman benefits. Why? Because the shaykh is saying here, when the man marries one, he has now taken the obligation upon himself to make sure, وَالْقِيَامِ بِحَقِّ زَوْجِيَّةِ 
ويسد حاجته إلى إحتاج إن إحتاج إلى أكثر من واحد اللي يقوزون فهي سين هي the point I'm just looking at here وقيام بحق الزوجية he will make sure that he is responsible now this is the difference between nikah and zina when it comes to zina a man he does what he wants and then he leaves may Allah protect us when it comes to nikah the man is fulfilling his desires he is getting the companionship that he requires but what? he's taking wajibat upon himself so she gets her haq and he gets his haq that way there is no dhulm that way there is no chaos and who is then protected? everyone involved if everyone, if everyone involved is protected then society will be protected so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the beginning of Surah An-Nisa فَانْكِهُ مَا تَعَوَلَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ marry whoever you pleases you from uh, from women مَثْنَ وَثُنَاثَ وَرُبَعَ 2, 3 or 4 فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا if you think that you are not going to be able to be just now what is this justice? the ulama have said justice here refers to two things number one time and number two maintenance if you feel that you're not going to have enough time in polygamy then it's not permissible and if you feel that you're not going to be able to maintain having two sets of families or three or four for wahida then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings it down for you to have only one and then the shaykh uh, rahimahullah gives us examples of those companions uh, there was a person called Aslam Ghailan al-Thaqafi he was married to 10 women at once. Uh, and then this ayah came down. So he came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, what do I do? So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, choose four and you need to now make talaq of the rest. Uh, and there was also another companion called Qais ibn Harith. He said, when I became Muslim, I was married to eight women. Now this is not to say that they were being irresponsible in their marriage. But we can clearly see today that uh, if nikah is not there, what would happen? We can see that with our own eyes for those people who do not follow religion. Or people who are Muslim but falling into this sin, may Allah protect us and protect them also. So when Islam came to them, he is saying, what do I do now in that scenario? How do I remain obedient to Allah and submit to Him? So with that now we learn the fact that justice is now being established and everybody's rights are being given so that people aren't walking away with just fulfilling their desires male or female the shaykh then says there are a number of wisdoms and fawaid and benefits as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated it number one the shaykh is saying here sometimes it's necessary Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who created man and he is the one who created women a woman might ask why is it fair that a man gets to marry and have multiple families and fulfill his desires that's how they perhaps might look at it and women don't get the same sort of thing. The Sheikh is saying here, أَنَّهُ قَدْ يَكُونَ دَرُورِيًا فِي بَعْدِ الْأَحْيَانِ Sometimes it might be a necessity for a man to get married more than once. Why? Because it could be that his wife is old, or his wife is not well, or his wife is not able to have more children, or a number of reasons the Sheikh is saying here. So the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated. Look, the first reason that he gives is not talking about desires. If you were to ask many of the shabab today, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala legislated polygamy? Are you interested in polygamy? Most of them, illa man rahimahullah, most of them will probably say, yeah, I want to do it. What for? Because Allah has allowed me to do it. I've got the desires to do it, whatever it might be. But the shaykh is saying here, no, actually, if you think about it, it could be that a man is in that situation because of more than just thinking about his desires. It could be that his wife has given him the love and all of those the things that you would imagine in a relationship, but this man might want to have more children. This man might not be able to have his desires fulfilled with his wife anymore. And it could also be and I think the Sheikh is going to mention this in the second or the third point. But I'll mention it now. It could also be, and I think this is the case for a lot of maturer brothers, is that when they see a woman, especially what we see in the world that's happening today, when they see a woman who needs that help and needs that support, how many times did the Messenger of Allah get married to another woman? 
And she wasn't a virgin. She wasn't the leader of her nation when it comes to beauty. But why did he get married? As the Shaykh will elaborate in a minute. But most of this was done from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to look after somebody who needs that help, somebody who might be vulnerable, somebody who might uh, have good qualities but she's by herself. Therefore, one of the, the reasons that the Sharia has taken into consideration to allow polygamy is not just desires. And I hope the, the, the young men can understand this, but also the sisters can understand this as well. Why? Because it is the man's responsibility. If he wants to get married to a second or a third or a fourth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to question him, Yawm al-Qiyamah, you've got more than one family. Did you fulfill rights? He's not going to ask him first thing, did you get your desires? The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask him, did you give them their rights? Were you just with them when it came to time, when it came to maintenance? If that man, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying here, is able to do that, then this is now something which is legislated for him. For in khiftum, if there is a fear, what is khawf? Khawf is that a person has a fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that Allah can bring some kind of recompense to this person because of negligence of something which is obligatory or has fallen into something haram. And both of them can happen through polygamy. So it's not about desires. If a man who has taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will read this ayah and not think of it just through the lens of desires. If a person does that, then I will say that is very dangerous. So the Shaykh is saying here, sometimes there is a necessity. And I know of brothers who get to a certain age, their, uh, their wives are not able to carry on in the marriage that the way that he perhaps wants. The Shaykh is saying here, this is now a way out. It's not definitely the go-to, but it is a way out. Second reason from the Fa'idah, that the Sheikh mentions, or the Fawai that the Sheikh mentions, is that it brings people together. It brings people together. And you will find this in so many examples in the seer of the Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah, for example, he married Juwayra bin Tahrith. She was now a woman, a young woman, but she was known for her intelligence. And when she became Muslim, she was known for her ibadah. I'm sure you've had this narration before the Messenger of Allah. Goes out for Salat al Fajr. He doesn't come back until nearly before Dhuhr. And he says to Juwayr, You sit in there since the time I left you at Fajr, Fajr time when it was dark. Now it's not nearly Dhuhr time. What was she doing? Making dhikr of Allah. How long? Three, four, five hours maybe. So she said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. So he says to her, If you said these three words, then that would have been better for you. As in, he taught her something which is easy. And heavy on the scales. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Adada khalqi. Warida wa nafsi. Wa zina tarashi. If you said these words, it would be better for you than had you remained in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sunrise until nearly zawal. Juwayriya, radiallahu anha. When she got married to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the whole tribe became Muslim. The whole tribe became Muslim. And there are plenty of examples of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention that in Surah Al-Furqan, ayah number 54, وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ مِنَ الْمَاءِ بَشَرَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created man from a fluid, فَجَعَلَهُ نَسَبًا وَسِحْرًا And he has made for them lineage and in-laws. And the ulama of tafsir, and the shaykh is saying here, and the ulama of tafsir have used this to say that one of the hikam, one of the fawaid of having polygyny being legislated, and again, look here, it's still no mention of desires. Still no mention of a man thinking, oh, well, if he's bored, then he can go somewhere else. No, the first one here is, there might be an actual need. There might be an actual need for the man to, you know, increase his family. And one of his wives may not be able to do that for him. So what do we say? Make talaq? No, don't make talaq. Just because you can't have children with one wife, keep that relationship there. But the, or she might have some kind of an illness or something, but keep that relationship, be good to her. Don't just break off the nikah contract, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you want. And the ulama have said that is mustahab, it's not wajib. But the second one here, he is saying here, because it increases the Muslim ummah, it increases brotherhood, it increases sisterhood. And this is something that I found also when I was in Saudi Arabia. I met one child, I call him child, he's a teenager, we were teaching him in, 
in the classroom and he said to me, I've got over 40 or 50 brothers and sisters. Over 40 and 50 brothers and sisters. I can't remember the number, but it's very high like that. I'm like, this is amazing. Um, the third reason that the Sheikh is saying here is that in actual fact, this is actually quite ironic, through polygamy, the rights of the woman is preserved. A lot of women would think through polygamy I'm getting, you know, the short end of the stick. <laughs> women are being preserved. Why? Because the Sheikh is saying here, through polygamy, they're getting maintenance. They're getting accommodation. They're getting an increase in children which perhaps they probably wouldn't have. And these are things that the Sharia has come in order for it to spread and not to be restricted. So it could be there is a woman, she was practicing, she can't find someone who she wants to get married to. It might be an option for her, polygamy. Why? So now a person might think, why is it that the woman? Why can't it be the man the other way around? Why? The answer to that is quite clear and obvious. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question the men for maintenance. You can't expect a woman to have four or five husbands and then go out when she is physically not able to do so. She has menses and, and things like that that she has to take into consideration. If she's got four or five husbands, she's going to have children. Therefore, it doesn't make sense. But the Shaykh is saying here, these things that we find that the Sharia has come to preserve and to encourage the spread of will be established through polygamy. Maintenance, accommodation, education, the increasing of lineage and children, reproduction, the preservation of people's chastity, and the list goes on. So through this now, we can see here, the Sheikh is saying here, if it is done correctly, and it is not done just purely for the sake of desires, the man has taqwa, the woman has taqwa, وَهَذَا أَمْرٌ مَطْلُمْ لِلْشَعْرِ These are the things that you will find that are legislated naturally from the, uh, from the things that the Sharia has come to encourage the establishment of. Sometimes these things will only be established if it is done through polygamy. And now the Sheikh says another reason that a man has more of a desire to be active than a woman. So it could be that a man is already married, but he still fears that he could fall into zina. Now here, this is a very important point that I feel perhaps sisters might never understand, might never understand. A man, zina is zina, right? We know what zina is, when a man enters into a woman who has not been allowed for her, either in the front passage or the back. This is the technical definition of zina. But there is zina duna zina. Zina, which is the less of the zina, talking, looking, touching, listening, smelling, all of these things are included in zina. The Sheikh is saying here, if the man is already married, but he fears that he will fall into zina, and now this word zina includes the major form as well as the minor form, it now becomes permissible for this person to help him to lower his gaze to help him to protect who he is talking to, to help him to protect whatever form of zina that he might fear for himself. فَكَانَ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى بِالْخَلْقِ This is a rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed for this to be legislated in our religion. A person will say, well, still I don't agree and it's not fair, but... If you look at the situation and the reality of sexually related crimes and divorce rates, even in certain Muslim countries, you will see it's either that or this. It's either that or the Sharia, should I say. The Sheikh then talks about the hikmah of the nikah, but I feel that this has already been uh, lengthier than... Uh, uh, then we planned. Inshallah, I think maybe we'll do this next week. Next week, inshallah, we'll be looking at the hikmah of the sharia and then the ruling on talaq and some of the things that come out from the repercussions if a person does decide 
for talaq or khula. Inshallah, we'll talk about those next week. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us tawfiq and success and he makes us of those who understand the religion and follow up in the best possible manner. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts tranquility in ourselves and into our homes and our relationships. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he fills amongst one another ourselves uh, the brotherhood and the sisterhood of Iman. Hada, wallahu a'lam. Sallallahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In our day age, yeah. can a cousin marry? Or maybe I should probably ask before that regarding Ahlul Kitab, the definition of Ahlul Kitab, the permissibility of marrying that, uh, you know, uh, that category of people, and is it permissible for a cousin to marry, a male cousin to marry, let's say, a female cousin who claims that they are from Ahlul Okay, so two questions here. The first question is can we uh, marry someone from a different faith? And the second question here is, is it recommended for us to marry someone who is a relative? As for the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the beginning of Surah Al-Ma'idah has said that we are married, we are permitted to marry their women. Who are Ahl al-Kitab? Some of the ulama have said Ahl al-Kitab are the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians. But the majority of the ulama have said that it only applies to the Jews and the Christians. In the ayat in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts two conditions now. That they have to be from the people of the book, and they have to be chaste. Chaste meaning that there is no zina in their relationship. So number one, they have to actually believe in their faith, irrespective of whether it's got kufr in it or not, because the Yahud and Nasara at the time of Messenger of Allah Sallam, believed in kufr, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it amongst that context. And the second one is that they are chaste, meaning that there's no zina. And we gave the definition of zina before. If these conditions are met, then it is permissible for a man to marry from the Ahl al-Kitab. It is not permissible for a woman from the Muslimat to marry except for a Muslim man. So this is something which is specific to the man. Again, a person will say, no, that's not fair. Where is the equality? And the answer is the same as you have heard with polygamy. The man is the one who is taking the contract. He is the one that is going to her and proposing. He is the one that is saying, listen, do you want to get married? Here's the piece of paper. I will agree to do certain things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question me on qiyamah. And I'm willing to take that as a risk. I'm willing to, you know, fulfill that obligation. As for the woman, she can't be expected to do those things. That's the first thing. Second thing, why is it for men? Now this is relating to your answer. Is that the man has... The role of tarbiyah in the home. This is also from what is wajib upon him. He has that presence and he should have that dominance. And unfortunately what we're seeing today is that we're finding a lot of men in their homes uh, are being very passive. Women are running the home. Women, And this is not necessarily a bad thing. But when they are now overstepping and the man, his role is being reduced, that is an imbalance. And not only will that affect the home, but it will affect the man and it will affect the relationship. The man is the one who should be in charge. And again, we're using these words and it might not necessarily fit in the culture and the society and perhaps the day and age because people will question that as well. Why is it that the man is in charge? This is because he's got the contract. He is the one that is going to be questioned. So he has to make sure everything is in order. If he wants to leave his wife to deal with certain things, that's up to him. But essentially, the authority should go through him. But again, these are words, authority, permission, which is often found in religious thoughts. It doesn't, if you look at the model of the Messenger of Allah, it doesn't necessarily mean in the way that those words are being used. With that, the ulama have said, if a man wants to marry a kitabiyya, she's from the people on the book, but that essence is not going to be met, then they have, some of them have said that it is makru. And I think this occurred at the time of Umar radiallahu and he actually put a stop to it and he said if you are going to marry these women who are going to marry the Muslimat if you're going to go looking for them who, and this is something which is well known I mean when um, historical uh, relevance to this is that when the Muslim empire opened up especially in the Sham region 
uh, the rumors and the culture at that time was that these women were seen as being really beautiful. You know, Eastern Europe, or Sham region. So now people were like trying to get married to the, because now it's all opening up. So Omar al is saying, okay, these are people kita, but if you marry these women, then who's going to marry our women? But it's not just about the looks. Here we're talking about what Omar al is basically saying here. And this has been mentioned and echoed in the books of fiqh, is that the man, if he chooses to marry a woman from the people in the book, he has to think about the long term. What about the tarbiyah? What about the balance? What about all of these other things? So this is why the ulama have said, okay, it's mubah. However, you have to now, this is another thing when it comes to usul al-fiqh. We've got mubah in, in the middle. The mubah, and this is a well-known principle in the sharia, Al-wasail, yani al-hukum, uh, al-hukum wasail, meaning that the, the ruling on something uh, takes the ruling on the objective that is going to end up with. It is permissible for you now to probably eat at 9, 10 o'clock at night. Permissible, nobody's going to say it's haram. But if you know that that's going to mess your digestion system up, or it's going to cause some kind of problems, or it's going to make you feel lethargic and you won't yet make up for fajr. So we will now say that that mubah has actually not turned in either to maybe makruh or haram. Mubah takes the ruling of wasail, and a lot of people don't understand that. They just think everything is mubah, 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 in does. But no, the ulama have a principle in itself, which is that mubah is a gateway to either one of these things. I've got a car, is it mubah or is it wajib or is it mustahab? Mubah. But if I know I'm going to use that car to come to the masjid five times a day, it's not mubah anymore because of my intention and my ability to upkeep the car. And I've got a place to park it there and a place to park it. And I'm going to make sure that I use it. Now it becomes mustahab. I've got a car. And I need to come to Salat al Jummah. This is now wajib for me to come to Salat al Jummah. If the only way that I can come is by car, it now becomes wajib for me to use that. Mubah is a gateway. Therefore, it's mubah for you to marry a woman from the people of the book. But the ulama, like you said, uh, many of the fuqaha have said that it leads to something either makru or maybe something otherwise. So a person has to look at that. As for relatives, then this is an issue where the ulama have differed. The majority of the ulama have said that you shouldn't marry relatives. And the reason why is because it could lead to cutting of ties of kinship if the uh, marriage is not upheld correctly. And it could lead to other problems when it comes to um, uh, the connection between the man and the wife. This is the view of some of the ulama. I said the majority of some of the ulama. Others from the ulama have said all of these are assumptions. And in order for you to get married to someone, you need to make sure that you know who this person is. So by marrying a relative, you know, you know the family. You know that she's probably not going to mess you around. The family is not going to mess you around because you know each other. You know each other for a long time. Therefore, this is the issue where the scholars have differed. However, like I said, I mean, I think last week we looked at what the Shaykh Rahimullah had to say when it comes to choosing and looking at the characteristics of the spouse. As long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَنْكِهُ مَا تَعَوْلَكُ مِنْ Marry whoever pleases you from women. This is general now. So when it comes to relatives or non-relatives, as long as you are happy with the, the, the characteristics which are necessary in a spouse, then inshallah there is no harm whether it's a relative or otherwise. But like I said, this is an issue where some of the scholars have discussed and some of them said encouraging uh, the marriage towards a relative and others have said no, it's not encouraged. Barakallah feekum, inshallah we'll continue next week. Subhanakallahumma bihamdulillah.